Hey, fire starters. We are on a seasonal hiatus, and we're taking some time right now to just enjoy being with our family, maybe work on some other things. But we wanted to share with you our top three downloaded shows for 2016. First of all, we start off with Connor Boyack. He was episode number 153. The podcast was called Creating Passion-Driven Education. Connor is the author of 10 books, including the popular Tuttle Twins children's series that I own every copy. (laughs) I absolutely love them. I can see why people wanted to listen to this one quite a bit. It is a great podcast on how to create passion-driven education. It's based off of his book, Passion-Driven Education, How to Use Your Child's Interest to Ignite a Lifelong Love of Learning. And I actually own the Audible copy as well as a hard copy. It's a book that I would love to spend some time talking about, but until then, you're going to have to listen to this great podcast. Merry Christmas. For me, the Constitution is a layer on top of these principles. Uh, it, it's not, you know, a principle unto itself. And, and especially if you're going to tackle something that big and boil it down to young children, you're going to leave a lot of the essential stuff out. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Connor Boyack. Connor Boyack is the founder and president of Libertas Institute, a free market think tank in Utah. Under his leadership, the organization has pioneered a number of successful policy changes in a wide range of issues in property rights, civil liberties, parental rights, economic liberty, government transparency, and education reform. Connor is the author of 10 books, including the popular Tuttle Twins children's series that teaches young kids about principles of liberty. He lives with his wife and two homeschool children in Lehigh, Utah. Welcome, Connor. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I have wanted Connor on our podcast since conception of The Luminous Mind because I love his books, especially the Tuttle Twin series. But before we get started on any of that, can you go ahead and tell our audience a little bit more about yourself? Sure. So uh, I actually grew up in San Diego, um, lived my whole uh, childhood, uh, young adult life there, moved uh, to Utah, got married and you know developed some roots here. I've got two kids. Um, and my it's kind of interesting. I, in the latest book uh, that I've written, which we'll talk about later, I, I kind of share some of my background where you know, I'm kind of an unlikely candidate to do a lot of what I'm now doing. And when people who knew me from my childhood realize or learn, you know, what I'm doing now, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, jarring for them to realize, well, wait a minute, you, you know, how did you turn into that? And uh, and so I've kind of had a, a, a self-study metamorphosis uh, after my college years where I've really kind of turned my uh, life, you know, completely different path, uh, completely different expertise and talents and priorities. Um, And so it's kind of a model where I came to it a little late in the game. And I think it's great for all of us as parents to talk about how we can give young children, you know, the same leg up on on life, the same opportunities and and freedom and and, uh, opportunity for, you know, discovering themselves and the world around them. So that's a large part of my work now is trying to help educate other people on those types of ideas. Well, and I want to hear the story. I want to hear the whole thing of how you came yeah. from one place to another. Tell me about that. So I, I grew up in your average uh, Republican conservative household. We weren't really too partisan or political. My my mom did uh, serve on our local city council, but that was more from a community service standpoint than like a you know political or ideological rather. Uh, standpoint. And so I I didn't really pay much attention to politics or government or bigger issues like that, uh, really at all. And 
Uh, and I think my mom had kind of tried here and there, but I just was disinterested. And as I was younger, I was actually, uh, there were some subjects that not only did I do poorly in, but I really grew to dislike. Um, one was English. I just didn't like how, you know, dry and, and dull, you know, having to sit in an English class was. I'm like, I know how to speak and, and write. Leave me alone. Like, why do I need to take this class? I really didn't like history. I, I found no value in it. Um, I just wanted to, you know, live the present and the future. And I didn't care about you know, dates and people and whatever. So I was really disinterested in history. And then later, especially like in college, when I had these types of classes, I really grew to dislike economics. Uh, I didn't do well in that at all or finance. I just, it was so dry and so like irrelevant to my life. So what's interesting is that uh, that's now flipped where those issues are my expertise and forte and, uh, you know, like it's really, <laughs> yeah, that's why I was it's, laughing. <laughs> it's really weird. Right. And, yeah. and so the way that it happened for me was really after college, I, in college, in my later years, I had an employer that would kind of spoon feed me a little bit, or at least kind of expose me, Hey, read this article or check out this. And so I had gotten some light exposure, but you know, when you're in school, you're just bombarded with tests and assignments and your mind is filled with busy work. And I didn't have capacity to really ponder and, and pursue the things that I've now become interested in. So while there was a little bit of passing awareness of some of these ideas, it wasn't until after college, I started just kind of reading different books and I had free time to do so. You know, I had a job at that point, but I, I had, you know, I could clock out at five basically and, and come home or on the weekends or whatever. And I just, I had time to pursue uh, and use mental energy on the things that I found curious where I didn't really have that all through my schooling years. And so I started reading a lot about American history, about the Constitution, um, that led into more philosophical ideas and economic ideas. They're also integrated, really. Once you get into them, you understand there, there really is no politics and economics and history. It's like one great whole all wrapped up together. And so I would go off on all these tangents and I would read one book and, and that author recommended these four other books. And, and it was just kind of Alice down the rabbit hole where I read and read and read and read. And, and I, I developed this interest, which turned into a passion. And I set my own goals. I had the freedom to pursue whatever I wanted in whatever way I wanted at whatever speed I wanted. So really it was two factors. It was one having, you know, the time and mental energy to pursue those things, but then also the freedom to be able to do it. I wasn't having to compete with anyone else forcing me to learn certain things or memorize or, or complete certain tasks. Um, and so that time and that freedom really enabled me to pursue this path that has now turned for me into a full-time profession. You know, I was a web developer for 15 years. That, that was my formal education, was in information technology. I had freelanced. I started a, a little business doing that on the side. And that's where I thought my career would take me until after college, this hobby and educational curiosity of mine developed into, you know, a, a uh, it developed into basically a full time hobby to the point where I'm like, I can't sustain uh, doing all of this side stuff, you know, blogging and political involvement and campaigns and everything else on top of my job. Like I just couldn't sustain it. And so it got to the point where I said, you know what, that's where my passion is. You know, when I wake up in the morning, what fills my mind with thoughts? It's those things, not my, you know, web development. Like I don't get excited about that. So I figured out a way to turn it into a full-time profession. I, I launched Libertas Institute. Uh, we've been able to grow and be successful by any measurement. Uh, and it's been a ton of fun along the way. That's awesome. Well, and I want to hear maybe some of the challenges that you had along the way and what you feel like you've learned from them. I think that's like when those aha moments come, right? Is sometimes with those challenges? Yeah, that's that's a great question. The first one that comes to mind is kind of a chicken and egg scenario where when I was trying to start Libertas Institute, I would talk to prospective donors, potential supporters about this idea that I had. And the response generally that I got was, huh, sounds interesting, but come back to me when you've already like got it up and running. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, well, how do I get it up and running without the financial support necessary to do so? And so it was this chicken, the egg thing where I had to figure out a way to launch this thing uh, without any money because these potential donors wanted proof. They wanted a demonstration that I could pull this off, that I was serious, that I was willing to sacrifice 
And so what I ended up having to do was for the first year, uh, Libertas Institute was kind of a nights and weekends project. Uh, so I, I still had my job. Uh, I assembled a, a team of other volunteers. You know, we would produce articles, do some research, do some marketing stuff, but it was all just on lunch breaks or, you know, after the kids were in bed at night. But that showed to these potential donors we were serious about it. We were committed that even at a sacrifice of our own free time, we wanted this thing to exist. So that's when, you know, these potential donors were able to say, okay, I'm willing to put my money in because I know you're not just going to, you know, collapse in a few months. Like you're really serious about this. And so I hadn't anticipated that up front. I, I thought it would be easier to kind of get it off the ground. Uh, but we had to bootstrap it a bit. And so that was that was a challenge for me where I had this grand vision of what I wanted our organization to be. But we had to kind of get into it a little bit slowly. I had to prove myself not only to others, I had to prove myself, I think, to myself and show, you know, it's it's a daunting task to, wow. to start a nonprofit organization, especially one with goals as ambitious as ours um, and really trying to change public policy and, and change, you know, affect the lives of, of, you know, untold numbers of people here in Utah and elsewhere. It was a it was a big task. And you know, I had no formal training in this. So the self-doubt that you talk about was very prevalent in, in those early days because, you know, I didn't go to school in nonprofit management. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I hadn't run any other organizations other than my own little sole proprietor freelance business. Um, so I, I didn't have any formal training, any experience. And here I was trying to just do this ambitious thing. Uh, so it was very much like my political and philosophical awakening was. It was all self-taught. It was experimental. It was trial and error. Uh, fortunately, we had you know more, many more successes than failures, and, and so we've been able to grow it pretty quick and and uh, make a difference from the outset. But it's still daunting when you know you're trying to do something that you don't quite know how to do, and so you have to teach yourself and and lean on mentors and find others who have gone before you who can help. It was definitely a learning experience. Well, and I love talking about the challenges because we do learn a lot from those challenges. I mean, all the things that you had to learn in order to grow, you know, who you are, I'm sure is kind of a becoming of who you are now. So Yeah, that's exactly right. So when you talked about, I mean, you kind of have a long story of, not a long story, but, <laughs> but you know, a longer story of your awakening to principles of liberty and different things like that. What do you feel like your overall paradigm change was through all this time experience? Do you have any... Is something you can pinpoint? That's a good question. So when the paradigm changed, I think for me, I think a lot of people struggle with uh, what I label anyways as inconsistency, where they claim to adhere to a set of principles, and they generally do, but they have their few issues that they make an exception for. And they haven't really, in, in my experience, most of these people haven't thought that through it's not like they have a, a physical list that they've taken the time to put pen to paper and say, I believe in the free market for, you know, these 83 things, but not for these six things. Like, yeah. no, it, it's not or that Or the conscious. non-aggression principle. Type yeah, thing. yeah, exactly. And so that was me, right? Because I, I uh, you know, I was this general conservative. I really didn't know what I believed. I, I had a, an outcome-based approach to policy. My opinions were just like, yeah, that seems right for that issue. And then on another issue, it would just be a separate, independent, arbitrary decision as to what I would support. And so for me, the, the paradigm shift, I think, came from reading the writings of Ron Paul. I came across Congressman Ron Paul in 2006. There was a documentary called America, Freedom to Fascism. And it was by Aaron Rousseau, who has since deceased. Uh, he was trying to show that these grand and noble principles upon which America was founded have basically been entirely abandoned, and now we have fascism. And it was a very interesting analysis, uh, documentary. It was very eye-opening for me because it was kind of right at the outset of my own uh, personal awakening. And I remember watching that and there was this gentleman in there who made a lot of sense. And that I you know, later found out was Ron Paul. I started reading a lot of his speeches. And what struck me more than anything was that even though these speeches were on a wide range of issues, they had a common thread or a foundation. And that was something that I hadn't at that point had a lot of exposure to, that intellectual consistency rather than the inconsistency that I, I've later been able to identify, I think is our one of our greatest political problems. And so I started reading a lot uh, by him. I started reading the books that he had recommended that had inspired him. 
and uh, gaining more of a philosophical understanding of what those principles were that did form that foundation. And it's interesting because now in our work with Libertas Institute, among the many things we do uh, is we'll take positions on uh, legislation here in Utah and say, you know, good bill, bad bill, here's why. And what's interesting is in other organizations, they have entire committees dedicated to like deliberating what their organization's position will be. Um, You know, do we strongly support this? Do we moderately support this? Should we, you know, oppose it? Whatever. And and sometimes these people will say, well, how do you guys do it? Like who's on your selection committee or what's what's the process? And I say, it's a gut instinct. It takes literally two seconds once you understand what the bill does to think through, you know, what whether this uh, adheres to or violates the the uh, related principles. It's, It's not hard to understand if, you know, a bill that prohibits homeowners from renting their homes on Airbnb uh, whether that violates property rights or not. You don't need to have a two-hour discussion about it and decide what position you'll, you'll come to. And so that foundation has served me well where very easily you can you can see if things pass the sniff test and if they support or oppose those principles. And and so for me, that was the paradigm shift, was, was encountering that philosophical foundation that uh, Ron Paul and then later, you know, as I discovered many others had, um, and I wanted to make it my own, and I have, and it's it's served me well. It's been very helpful in in understanding proper principles, proper role of government, um, especially in our policy work, but even in teaching my children. Um, you know, when we try and help them understand what is right and wrong, it, you know, there's not variance in public policy where some things are right at some times, but at other times they're not, just because some elected officials say so. Like there's. There's something deeper going on, and, and what is that? And, and for me, getting those principles, getting that foundation was the paradigm shift. That's awesome. So kind of what I'm getting out of it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe that a lot of people segment things. You know, we segment um, our religious thing from our politics, from our, you know, from our education, um, from being a good person, but yet with just different groups like that. We've segmented ourselves, but... Yep. Um, from what I'm getting from you is once we have a principal base, all of those things kind of come together and mesh better. I, that- I, I think that's very fair. You know, like in a lot of my uh, public policy work at the end of the day, it's about trying to help families be, you know, happier, freer and more prosperous. And um, and so even if we're working on some abstract principle dealing with transportation issues or whatever, it all ties back into the family. It ties back to the individual, and and everything I think is interrelated. We can't treat each thing as a separate bucket or or segment, like you say. Um, I, I think it does a disservice to each individual thing if we disconnect them from the others. I, I think they're interconnected. I think we need to treat them as such. Um, and I think in that way, you know, religious people become political people. Education oriented people become you know, uh, cultural people, like everything is tied together and we can't just isolate the one from the other. I I think we do a greater service to ourselves, to our families, our communities, if we approach life uh, from that more holistic standpoint rather than a a segmented standpoint. Look at the big picture. Right. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Let's you know. Let's talk about families a little bit, and maybe the inspiration that you had um, sure. behind your Tuttle Twins series. Like I said, I just adore Tuttle Twins. Every time he's got a new book coming out, our homeschooling group gets together and we send off for large quantities because they're wonderful. <laughs> but go ahead and t- give us the inspiration behind them, and then we'll kind of talk about each one and what they're about. Sure. Thank you uh, for that compliment. The The background of these books is that as a few years ago, I was looking on Amazon uh, for literature for my young children. I've got two kids. And at the time they were, I think, uh, five and two or three or something like that. And I was looking online, trying to find things that w- would teach them. You know, you get things like the Berenstain Bears and it teaches them about hygiene or about <laughs> being honest. And that's great. Like it, it, it's a good introduction or segue for parents to also discuss those principles with their children. So I wanted to find the counterpart that would teach the philosophical ideas that I value. Things like the free market and natural law and individual liberty and property rights and you know even the non-aggression principle and things like that so i i went on a hunt and came up short there was literally nothing 
And uh, there was some stuff for older kids, you know, like the Uncle Eric series yeah, of books, are- the Penny Candy and so forth. Um, but that's like preteens and teens. And I wanted to find stuff for young kids because that's what, you know, I had a, <laughs> young children. <laughs> what is there for them? And literally there was nothing. Uh, there was a l- tiny bit of stuff about the Constitution for little kids, like little activities mostly. Um, but but for me, the Constitution is a layer on top of these principles. Uh, it, it's not, you know, a principle unto itself necessarily. So, well, and, and don't go, I don't mean to cut in right here, but please. don't you feel like some of those Constitution books or things that I've seen, um, really, they come from a false sense of like what was really behind the Constitution. I mean, yeah. that's that's what I've gotten is it's kind of been updated, I mean, in a really bad way of like trying to justify, you know, how or why we have certain things the way we do now. Yeah. And, and especially if you're going to tackle something that big and boil it down to young children, you're going to leave a lot of the essential stuff out. And so for me, I wanted to go to just the really foundational level of the ideas. What were the ideas that inspired the Constitution or rather, you know, the founding fathers? What were the ideas that inspired the revolution and the declaration? What were the ideas that have, have made society progress and have more prosperity and freer markets? And, and there, was, there was nothing uh, at all. And so uh, a friend of mine is an illustrator, uh, designer, just very talented um, individual, graphically, creatively, and he is very like-minded. And so I talked to him about this idea of, of doing our own book series, and he loved it. He loved the idea. And, and so we said, you know, the, the problem is we don't know if there's a market out there for this. And we weren't going to start like a focus group or a survey and, and try and do it that way. We said, you know what, let's just do one book. And if that book is a flop and a failure and just no one buys it, that's fine because that book will exist uh, and, and we will have willed it into existence and, <laughs> and, it, and it will benefit our children. And that's at the end of the day, like that was our primary goal was producing a book, a fun book to teach some foundational ideas for our kids. And if other people liked it, great, then we'll keep it going. If not, it wouldn't be a failure because the book would exist and we would be able to use it and it would have been a fun project. And so uh, we started uh, with the, we, we, we've had to figure out like, okay, if we're only doing one book, <laughs> you know, what, what's the one book that we want to do? And so for both Elijah and I, we had been significantly influenced by Frederick Bastiat's uh, booklet, The Law. Oh, I love and, that. Yeah. And so we, we wanted to choose that as our, our first book. So our first book is The Tuttle Twins Learn About the Law. It incorporates all of the, the basic ideas and principles that are in Bastiat's essay, wraps them in kind of a fun story. And fortunately for us, the, the response was overwhelming. It's been fantastic. Tons of people love them. I think many have recognized that nothing like this exists, that it fills a void it, it supplements parents in talking to their children about these ideas, whereas I don't think many parents would think to talk about these concepts with, you know, an eight-year-old. Maybe they'd probably think, oh, yeah, when they're teens, we can start talking about these things. But these are concepts that can be very accessible to young children, and wrapping them in a fun story like this and making the ideas simple enough to convey them to young minds, these, these kids understand it and they enjoy it. And so why not? Uh, appeal to to those young minds, especially because the quote unquote opposition is absolutely doing that. These yeah. kids are getting spoon fed false philosophy and bad economics every day, especially if they're in public school. So we wanted to kind of play in that sandbox and offer parents a, a competing curriculum, if you will, so that they could expose their children to true principles rather than false ones. Awesome. Well, let's kind of go through the titles of what they are and what they teach. Um, the, the first book was The Law, and it taught the foundation of liberty. What's the second, third, fourth? And then he has yeah. a new book coming up. The, the There's four on the website and then the new one as well. Yeah, yeah thank you. So the website is TuttleTwins.com, and the second book is called the Tuttle Twins and the Miraculous Pencil. This is based on an essay written, I think, in the 1950s by Leonard Reed called I Pencil, and it teaches the, the beauty and the miracle of the free market using an example of a pencil, that no one knows how to make something as simple and common as the number two pencil. In fact, it requires millions of people spontaneously working together collaboratively. I think of even just like the wood you know, the wood requires a logger 
but the logger requires a chainsaw and he doesn't know how to make a chainsaw, right? So the, the chainsaw manufacturer, they require um, a, a commercial facility in which they operate and they don't know how to, you know, do construction and construction workers require roads and they don't know road design. Like all, everyone is so interdependent just to produce a simple pencil. And then you think of complicated things like the computers we're using to talk to one another or, you know, things like that. It, it just becomes astounding to recognize what the market can do. So we teach children the awe, the, the awesomeness of, of the, the free market. Um, and that's the second book. And the, the third is called The Tuttle Twins and the Creature from Jekyll Island. This is kind of a fun, darker story a little bit because uh, it's got this evil creature. It's based on a book from G. Edward Griffin called The Creature from Jekyll Island. And it's in reference to the Federal Reserve, uh, which is a series of private banks that control the American economy. Um, it was granted a charter and created by Congress in 1913. So the original book talks a lot about central banking um, and inflation and money. Um, and so our book does the same. It talks about, well, what is money? Why don't we use gold anymore? What is inflation? How does it hurt some people? Um, what is, you know, a bank? Uh, what is a federal, re the federal reserve? Things like that. Um, and so it uses kind of the story of the grandparents whose savings is being eroded through inflation. And so they're uh, on a fixed income. They're dealing with something that, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not probably millions of Americans are experiencing. Um, and so it creates, it uses that very real example to introduce some of these financial principles. But again, with kind of this fun, darker uh, creature so that it engages kids and they want to figure out who the creature is. <clears throat> so that's the, the third book. And then finally, the fourth one is uh, just came out earlier this year. It's called The Tuttle Twins and the Food Truck Fiasco. This one is based uh, on a book by uh, Henry Hazlitt called Economics in One Lesson. Very interesting book uh, that really boils down economics to one lesson, as it says. Um, and, of course, it goes into a lot more detail around that one lesson. But we wanted to base our book on that one uh, because it introduces important ideas like uh, competition, uh, f business, profit, um, even things like marketing and such. Uh, the, so this is kind of a more business-oriented book. The, the twins uh, help liberate um, some businesses from an unfair regulation uh, that is disadvantaging uh, these food trucks uh, in comparison to the restaurants. Uh, what's funny about this book is at Libertas Institute, we're working on this exact policy right now where uh, in Utah, food trucks are being overregulated um, and are being prohibited from competing with restaurants in many cities. So it's kind of funny. This is very much a real world thing. But think of uh, something that more of your listeners would know about, and that is uh, things like Uber or Lyft versus the taxis or Airbnb or uh, VRBO versus the hotel industry. You get these new innovative uh, industries that find themselves over-regulated. Uh, their new business model does not fit in the old regulation model that the government has. And so that advantages the established uh, players in the market and disadvantages the new entrants from fairly competing. So it's a very much a real thing happening all over the place. Um, and so we want to kind of incorporate those ideas. It, it really fundamentally teaches about uh, this concept called protectionism, right, where you uh, certain industries or market players are protected with the law uh, from, from having to compete against others. And so that's what the fourth book is about. And then finally, the fifth one, which comes out in November, is called The Tuttle Twins and the Road to Serfdom. Uh, if any of your listeners are familiar with F.A. Hayek, they'll probably recognize that this will be based on his book called The Road to Serfdom, except our serfdom is with a U, um, and it's the name of a beach called Serfdom, and there's an actual road uh, that is created to take the... Uh, take the community to this new beach. And so you uh, introduce ideas like central planning, uh, unintended consequences, eminent domain, uh, socialism, things like that to help people understand the, the things that Hayek was writing about as well. Again, making it accessible for young kids, introducing these ideas in a fun way. Um, and so we're probably going to do, I think, about 10 books by the time we're done. But number five, uh, yeah, will be out, I think, in November. And then one that's uh, who's going to build the roads, right? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. That's 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 incorporated here. Is figuring out who who should build the roads. It's what every libertarian or you know, <laughs> limited government person wants to figure out. Uh, well, and they are really great. Like you said, they're all based on um, books that we as adults um, consume and understand, but put in a, a place you know that a child would understand. So, tell me some of the success that you've seen with those books. Um, you know, we've talked about how they've been popular, but have you seen people that you know it's kind of changed their lives type of thing? I'll, I'll tell you the greatest success I think of the book was uh, an un, un, excuse me an unintended one, and that is we set out to educate children, uh, but we're educating a substantial number of adults along the way. And reason being is that many of the parents who are acquiring the book series have never, you know, read any of these original books upon which ours are based. Uh, they're not too familiar, if at all, with the ideas, maybe only superficially. Uh, and so here we provide them with an opportunity to sit down with their child and read this very non-threatening, engaging, fun book. Uh, and along the way, they learn. And the, the parents themselves, you know, especially homeschool parents, they're overburdened and stressed out. They're taking on so much. You know, if we were to hand them a, a you know, 250-page book on, you know, economics in one lesson, good luck getting, you know, <laughs> the average homeschool mom to read that. She's got stuff to do. But here you've got a 60-page, beautifully illustrated, fun story that conveys the root of those ideas. Uh, we're finding and, and hearing from, they, they write to us, many parents who are enthused and intrigued because they're newly being exposed to these ideas as well. Uh, that is not something we anticipated doing. We figured our primary audience would be uh, people who were already familiar with the original books, you know, wanting to provide their young children with uh, a counterpart. Uh, but I would say that's maybe it's like gone 50, the other way. Yeah. yeah, that's like 15% of our audience. The majority is people who are entirely new to these ideas. Well, and the cool thing is, is they're all based on, you know, real principles, not just, not just fun little stories that there's something behind that, that they yeah. can, and then the parents can expound upon that, you know, as they grow and get older too. <laughs> and then you as a parent who was probably publicly educated and <laughs> didn't get that understanding exactly. of how things go. That, yeah. That's great. Before we go on, let's listen to this message. Recently, the Luminous Mind became an affiliate for EduSense, which offers tremendous discounts on educational supplies. I personally use EduSense to purchase our family supplies because of their great prices, responsive shipping times, and best of all, the chance to earn EduBucks, which I use towards future purchases. Who doesn't love a great deal within a deal? To get a 90% savings on your EduSense materials, go to theluminousmind.net and click on the sponsor page to find the affiliate link. Start using EduSense to illuminate your educational experience. homeschooling and stuff like that, but how we feel like we can implement these books into our kids' education. Um, I understand that you have an accompanying study guide that mm -hmm. would help. Tell us kind of how you could kind of make that into more of a formalized curriculum if you wanted. So uh, I come at this from a little bit different approach, and it ties into the, the latest book I've written for parents called uh, Passion Driven Education, where I, I, don't exp I don't give my children curriculum. Um, I don't make them learn things. I don't, you know, require them to do stuff. I, I think we should completely eliminate coercion from education. Um, it, this is born uh, from my own experience in, you know, the, with the story I shared at the outset of seeing how much I uh, undervalued and, and disliked uh, the things that I was required to learn that, oddly enough, have now become my main interests. And so I try and approach uh, education with my children the same way. I think that it's at least an ideal model, um, one that I, you know, struggle each day to to uh, fully adhere to. But the ideal for me is exposing children to you know, all sorts of information that they may find interesting, but then letting them 
be at the steering wheel of their own educational path. Um, and so that's why we try and make the Tuttle Twins books, you know, fun and interesting and something that they want to read. I, th I think we're succeeding. A lot of the stories that we've heard from parents, you know, are that their kids read the books over and over and over again, which helps with retention, of course. Um, and, and so I, you know, we've tried even with the, so we do an activity book and every book has like a 20 ish page series of activities that, you know, if the parents uh, want and uh, the children want, they have a fun opportunity to maybe do a crossword puzzle or a service project or a discussion group or whatever uh, based on, on, on the book that they read. And so we want to provide kind of a supplement to the parents to do it. <clears throat> but I've never really anticipated turning uh, the Tuttle Twins uh, idea or the, the, the books into anything necessarily as a formal curriculum. I think more than anything, what I would want to see happen is that it's kind of a, a launching pad or a, an inspiration for parents to then figure out for their specific child and their specific interests what might be something interesting that they could do their own spin on something. Or maybe they end up going to city council meetings and taking notes for you know their community's Facebook group to educate the public on what's happening. Or maybe they uh, start their own small business to apply the principles that they learned in the food truck fiasco book. Um, you know, I'm, I'm often asked, um, what people can do to be able to do what I do. Um, you know, like, Hey, how can I be involved? Or I, I want to support you guys, or I want to do, you know, what you're doing and, and how do I do that? And my general answer is, you know, I don't have any recommendations about that at all because I think every person has their own path, their own unique talents. And maybe in some limited circumstances, that person will be the right fit to come work for us or do what I do and follow the same path. I, I really believe in the division of labor. And each of us has unique talents, unique interests that will form our own path um, that we forge. And I think part of life, too, is, is the forging of that path, not following somebody else's path, not doing what society thinks you should, not you know completing a, a curriculum that someone else has provided you off the shelf, but in navigating uh, your own path in the process, discovering yourself uh, and discovering the world around you. So it's much more of a flexible, dynamic approach that I prefer to take. Um, and so I guess the short answer to your question is we've never really anticipated anything more formal than just providing parents a resource uh, that they can use in, in whatever creative, interesting, unique way uh, they can think of in their family. Well, and I love the idea we kind of talked about before we started. You you talked about it just a minute ago, too, that kids could get together like for discussion questions. You know, I think it is a great way that you could, you know, great books that have um, – the principles underneath, you know, lying there um, that kids could get together and do a, like a colloquium type series with them. Yeah, you know, like that'd that. be phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. So let's kind of move into your book. You mentioned it, The Passion Driven Education. You know, what's the inspiration behind that book? Sure. So it, it's born of the exact story I shared at the outset that it took me until my mid 20s to love learning and find out how. Um, to find out where my path was. And as I began having children, I did not want them to wait. Uh, I didn't want to subject them to 15 years of what I thought they should learn or what society thinks that they should learn. Um, I wanted them to have those two elements that I referred to at the beginning, time and freedom. And so I wanted to find a way that, that they could uh, embrace those at a very young age. And so that combined with, you know, all sorts of different sources, great books, TED Talks, uh, families I know who have kind of implemented something like this model over time. All of those ideas um, culminated in a presentation that I began giving a couple years ago. Uh, I've since given this presentation. I, I call it uh, Passion Driven Education. Uh, to audiences around the country over the past couple of years and decided um, earlier this year to turn it into a book to, you know, get the ideas out there a little bit more. Fundamentally, what it's about is um, finding a way to help your children preserve their natural curiosity. Every child is naturally curious. It's the way we're wired. Uh, there's some fascinating research about the neural development of, of babies um, and just through observation and imitation, how, how uh, young humans learn. Uh, I think it's the school system 
um, that really hampers, uh, impedes, and in many ways completely eliminates that natural desire of curiosity to the point that it needs to be rehabilitated later in life <laughs> for, for many of these adults, and maybe some never get that. Um, and so I want to find a way to preserve that for my children and then obviously to help other families be able to do the same. The way that I found success is in this idea that I've called passion-driven education. What I So I gave a keynote address uh, a couple weeks ago to this large charter school organization of teachers and everyone else. And, and what I uh, conveyed to them, I was talking about this idea, is that too often I think that we speak to children in different languages. Imagine if you were to place a child into Bosnia and all of a sudden expect them to figure out how to you know, take care of themselves and go about life speaking a completely foreign language. Well, that's absurd, and we yeah. would be a ne negligent parent for doing so. What happens when in trying to educate our children, we speak to them in the language of math or in the language of science or in the language of history, and we treat each subject in its own abstract uh, bucket or segmentation as you were referring to earlier. Let me give you a more concrete example to drive home what I'm saying. Rather than speaking in those different languages, like for math, you're speaking in like, you know, X and Y, or in history, you're speaking of, you know, dates and people, or in science, you're speaking of all these different, you know, names of, of uh, you know, genus, uh, different animals and, and scientific processes or whatever. What if instead you use the language that the child is familiar with? So, and that I think is the child's world. Uh, what goes through their mind, what they're interested in. And so the examples that I share in, in the book are the way uh, we do it in my home. So to be very specific, uh, my son, as an example, loves angry birds. Uh, he loves it to the point where he's like memorized everything there is to know about angry birds. He loves it. Some would say he's obsessed with it. I think that's a negative connotation on what should be a very you know, positive opportunity where this is a language that my child has developed a fluency in all on their own. So rather than speaking to him in the language of math, uh, what if I taught him math in the language of Angry Birds? Because now I'm using a fluency he's already developed. Um, I'm not speaking to him in, you know, Bosnian or whatever language they <laughs> speak in Bosnia. I don't even know. And now I feel kind of embarrassed that I, I, <laughs> maybe it is Bosnian. I don't know. But I'm, I'm speaking to him in the language of Angry Birds. And so rather than saying 2x plus y equals, you know, 8 or whatever, I can say two mighty eagles, you know, plus... Um, a bomb is one of the other birds or whatever. I can, all I do is replace the variables uh, with acronyms for angry birds. And, and when I, we started when he was six and my, my six year old started learning algebra beyond what kids twice his age learn in school. And for him, it wasn't learning. It was this unique, fun thing to keep playing with angry birds. When I teach him about science, I use things like when I taught him about gravity or force and acceleration, I used the physics inside the angry birds game itself to introduce these principles like, hey, you know, do you know why? Oh, and he flips the rubber band. Why they, <laughs> yeah. Why the birds fall down? Where? As in the Angry Birds space game, if you fling them into space, they keep going. Why is that? And so it really boils down to speaking to children in a language they already understand and exposing them to all of these different subjects, but using their passion, their interest as the hook. And all of a sudden, children love it because you're, you're affirming their interest, you're affirming their individuality, but you're helping them learn more about a world they already appreciate. It's not taking young Connor and saying, hey, we're going to teach you about supply and demand curves. It's, hey, you like, you know, um, Jurassic Park. I, I want to teach you about what it would cost to actually operate the Jurassic Park facility. Is that something that would be interesting? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, you know, because then I'm learning more about dinosaurs and the, the movie that I loved as a youth. Um, so really, it's 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 just latching on to what kids are already latching on to themselves. So obviously, the book goes into a lot more depth, um, some of the, the pedagogy and the, the principles behind it, some of the examples and the success stories and so forth. Uh, but it's been a really fun process in our family. Uh, in other families, we've observed doing this as well because you, you really um, – 
shy away from the off the shelf curriculum and what some, you know, textbook developer thinks your child should know at a specific age. And you're letting children be individuals and take charge of their own lives and learn in a way that we as adults learn. We don't learn as we learned in school for those of us who went, you know, to public school. That, that's an arbitrary and fake way to learn. And so it's really letting children be humans and, and be like adults and mimic and, and practice and grow, um, not in an arbitrary way, but in a much more natural and organic way. Uh, we've had good success with it. You know, obviously the book uh, has more detail, but that's kind of the gist of the idea. Oh, I love it. So it's, it sounds like it's a framework kind of of how parents can take their own messed up education. I mean, because I do have a hard time like relating because I was learning the, you know, the language of algebra instead of learning the language of parenting, you know, or exactly. learning the language of laundry, you know, type of thing, or Every which are home- total skills that we need, you know, to right. understand. And every homeschooling parent, I, I stress this in the book because it's something I've seen so often, homeschooling moms especially feel like they need to be subject matter experts in every subject under the sun. Otherwise, their child will miss out. And obviously with co-ops and things, we're now starting to be able to supplement that and parents can receive support from others with expertise in different areas. But under this approach, a parent is not a subject matter expert in anything. You're just a resource provider that if your child you know, develops an interest in um, you know, Star Wars, all you're doing is finding things to expose your child to as they develop their passion more and more deeply. Maybe you're taking them to, you're driving them to an apprenticeship that they've uh, been able to do, or you're talking to your neighbors about, hey, you know, does anyone work in this profession? Can my child job shadow you? Like you're helping your, your child network and find the resources mm-hmm. they need rather than thinking you need to know everything that you then have to pass on to them. It's much more liberating. Yeah. Well, and I love the kind of the flipped idea. I mean, in, in my mind, it seems flipped, especially from where we came from, kind of that socialist education of, you know, these are the subjects that you'll learn and um, and then flipping it to um, to things that you love to do. Um, and we kind of have the mindset or at least I do is the fear you know behind like well if I let my kids just do what they love that's all they're going to do kind of like you said they they develop an obsession with something but um but kind of putting it back to what you you said though is that you know if we can put the the language I love how you've phrased that I guess of you know put the their learning in their own language they'll expand that they'll expand that learning and they'll actually learn more than when they're forced to learn well and yeah and what we were talking about before with fear and you know the elections and, and everything governed with fear uh, I talk about this at length uh, in the book as well is Parents too often let themselves parent through fear. And and especially when it comes to education for their children, they, they fear their child missing out. They fear uh, lack of opportunity. They fear... What you know, other not, people are going to think of them type of thing. Right. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I think we need to operate more from a position of faith. That maybe if your child wants to you know, uh, ride horses all day, every day, and that's their passion. Maybe we need to have faith that this isn't an unhealthy practice, but this is part of their individuality and their life path and have faith that they're going to find, you know, some horse related career or whatever (laughs) in the future that, you know, and if not, maybe they're going to find a very meaningful life skill and hobby that will make them feel very valued and, and be a huge part of their life. Like, when we curtail these children from spending significant amounts of time on on things, even video games, there was a, a story I didn't include in the book of a parent who was very concerned about this when their child was attending uh, Sudbury Valley School, which is kind of a formalized unschooling approach, and they were worried about it. Well, that that child went on to be a video game developer, a very successful uh, developer creating video games because it started with their passion of, of being a consumer of those games, turned into a very lucrative profession and a very meaningful uh, skill for them to have. And so it, it's hard to predict the future. And when we operate in a position of faith and clamp down and say no or regulate it too much, it's not that we shouldn't be parents and make sure they have balance and all that kind of stuff. But but I think we need to be careful that we're not disincentivizing or discouraging the development of, of passions, quote, obsessions, um, that might turn into their futures if we let them. Oh, what a, I could, we could go on and on about that because there's so many inspiring thoughts that come to my mind. But 
um, one question that I did have for you was um, with with parenting on this and, and creating that balance, how do you let them follow that passion? How do you feel like you let them follow that, you know, obsession that they have, but then also keep them balanced? So, you know, like when it comes to my son and Angry Birds, there have been a couple times where it, it clearly got a little bit too excessive. And so we just decided to take a little break. It wasn't, you know, you can never do it again or whatever. But we just said, look, we're going to we're going to stop, you know, the role playing and the, the playing on the games. We're just going to take a little break. And uh, and, you know, you can do plenty of other stuff and and whatever. And. And we'll come back to it in a little bit. And that just allowed a little bit, a little bit of a reset um, to make sure that the balance was appropriate. I think to the extent that, that, you know, my kids are doing, you know, chores or things that I've asked them to, they're making sure to, to do all the other stuff that's expected of them. If they spend their free time, you know, role playing Angry Birds and playing with their stuffed animals and, and uh, interacting you know, with siblings and, and kids in the neighborhood, you know, that's not necessarily anything unhealthy. Certainly if a kid is sitting in front of a computer for nine hours a day, you know, playing video games, I think that's negligent parenting, right? That's not like, <laughs> that, that. that's not just passion-driven education. That's, you know, that that's an unhealthy, you know, uh, uh, amount of time being spent on that. But you know, where there is free time, I think to the extent possible, we need to grant our children the freedom to spend to spend it as free time and, and the way that interests them. And, and it, it's tough, right? Every circumstance is different. Every child is different. Like the worst thing that you can do in these types of interviews is, is say, this is how it should be done. Yeah. Every, you know, every parent, every circumstance should do this way. So I, I try and be very cautious and, and saying, look, this is how it works in our family. Here are the successes that we've seen. It's a, a very, uh, very much an alternative way of thinking to a lot of parents. But, you know, I've had uh, tons of people uh, reading the book before it came out to give, you know, their input and, and feedback and help shape the book along the way. And the response was so positive. And, you know, many of these parents had never considered this before. Many of them were kind of jealous of their children saying, yeah, we're going to implement this. And, oh, how I wish that my parents would have had this <laughs> book to do it with me. Um, and so I think there's value there, even if, you know, parents reading the book may adapt it in different ways or, you know, to different differing degrees. I, I think as a general rule, we need to, you know, provide our children freedom and allow them to, to find and discover themselves. I, I think that's the best service that we as parents can do is, you know, to the extent possible, as quickly as possible, help them find their identity and then support them as they develop it. Yeah. And then um, kind of what I was getting out of it is maybe, you know, you're making sure that he's, a, you know, active member of society, that he's not using it as a withdrawal. I mean, type of thing. That Absolutely. He's actually coming out and then he's yeah, out, great. he's able. Well, and I think I, I see less rebellion in the future, too. Sometimes parents want to clamp down and just take it away altogether. But if we like, hey, you know, you've got responsibilities, too. And then we also, you know, we love this thing on the side and. You know, but we'll let you do that when these other responsibilities are taken care of. Yeah, and, or yeah, even awesome. inspiring okay. entrepreneurialism. Like, how can they monetize what they do? Right? Like, if they, if they, uh, you know, going back to the video games. If if you like video gaming, maybe you can inspire your child to start a video game uh, vlog YouTube series where you start getting ad revenue, and the kid starts talking about you know his favorite video games and how to beat this level and whatever. Yeah. But now they're getting confidence, they're getting business experience, they're learning marketing, you know, like you can tie in all sorts of things to whatever the interest of the child is. You don't need to just isolate it and see it as a negative. Consider it as leverage, consider it as an opportunity to tie in other different, you know, subjects and, and opportunities. I, I think it could be a very positive thing, generally speaking. Yeah. All right. Not to, uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I do have one other question for you um, sure. in regards to education. You know, with all your public policy, the things that you do, we know that you homeschool your kids, but what, it, you know, what do you feel like the future of education could do to improve, you know, education and bring that passion into learning that's the more of the brick and mortar type of schools that we send our kids. Do you see that this could be implemented and in any part into traditional public school or what's the what's the future of public education? I, I think the future of public education is choice. Uh, it's something that that does not exist in most uh, public schools. You get a little bit of it when you move into charter schools in the states but that have But then they're state funded, right? And exactly. so they have they're beholden to the 
Yeah. Right. And they yeah, follow s- state standards. And so they don't differ a lot. And then, you know, you move into private or homeschooling. But but too often I find that especially homeschoolers will replicate in their home the schooling that they just abandoned. You know, like it's, it's literally school in the home rather than, you know, something different. But I, I think we're at the cusp of something really interesting. And that is the explosion of homeschooling co-ops. I think this solves one key problem, and that is uh, parental burnout. So you create this this support network with like-minded parents. Um, You have different expertise, you know, so one mom was a biology major, so she can, you know, do a little science class. And one mom was an English lit major, so she can do, you know, a writing class or whatever. And so you you create a community-based education model, which is really harkening back to, you know, the way things were often done before. Um, and so I, I think the, the explosion of two things, one is homeschooling co-ops, which are fueled, I think, especially by social media, where like on Facebook, we can identify who people are in our area that, that are homeschooling, that have the same values. We can create those networks uh, in, in our communities. I think the other thing is, is uh, the Internet, frankly, all the resources online. Uh-huh. The proliferation of things where now parents can really create a completely customized curriculum for their children. Uh, you don't have to rely on classes. And if you want classes, you can go online and take, you know, like Ron Paul Homeschool or Tom Woods Liberty Classroom or Khan Academy or Coursera or MIT, any number of things. Like we are going to the point not only where there's an abundance of educational material, but where the price point is plummeting towards zero. A lot of the materials I mentioned are absolutely free. Yeah. You can, and, and so, you can learn a lot on YouTube. You know? Absolutely. There's tons of stuff on YouTube. And so I think I think choice is the future of education. I think before too long, it's going to be very difficult for public schools to compete, especially as you see more states adopting what are called education savings accounts, which is this new idea, better than vouchers, a little bit different, where much like your health savings account, you're given money on a card to spend for your child's education. It's the tax money. And you can choose to send your child to public school, or you could use that money for a field trip or for a Khan Academy, you know, uh, or online video subscription or uh, going to this private school for a semester or study abroad or whatever. It becomes a, a decentralized way of educating children. And so public schools would then have to compete and you would introduce market principles into the schools so that they would have to basically compete for your dollars rather than being lazy and, and being uh, guaranteed those dollars. So I think choice is the future. I think to the extent that the laws can change to, to really infuse the process with choice and to the extent that we as parents can not only uh, harness the existing choices but push them down to our children, give them the choices of you know what do they want to do and what are they interested in. We're, we're at a point where I think it's so easy and uh, so much of that is available uh, we'd be fools, I think, not to take advantage of it. Yeah, and then we get the best quality too, right? Sure, so, great. Awesome. Well, before we say goodbye, I've had such a fun time talking to you, but give us some final parting words and then please give us your contact information, how we can get in touch with you. Yeah, uh, thanks again for having me on. I, I, I guess as a parting uh, word of wisdom, you know, it's it's so trite to say that, that the children are our future, um, that the rising generation is important, but this is something that statists, uh, and, and those that have a very big government type of approach have recognized and exploited uh, for almost a century now, back to the progressive era. And, and I think we need to compete. Those of us who understand proper principles and natural rights and proper role of government, like we, we need to make sure that our children are not being inculcated with bad ideas that we then have to root out of them in the future. When you look at how so many if, people are... If we are, can root them out, right? If at all. If <laughs> yeah. at all. Sorry. When you look at... No, that's fine. When you look at what's happening right now in American elections and the fact that, you know, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are the the two primary candidates, it's just a sore, it's a, to me, it's a, a stinging rebuke of our society that we've let it come to this. And when people say, how did we get this far? I always point to public education. Uh, when you look at the byproduct of, of public schools and the fact that so many kids are ignorant about the ideas that we've been talking about, well, of course, that leaves it to those who you know are conniving and, and want to exploit the system because no one else is paying attention. Nobody cares. So I think we really need to invest in the future. 
Um, it's, it's hard to change the present, hard to change the minds of adults. Uh, but if we strategically find ways to educate the rising generation and give them a foundation of freedom, I'm very confident about what the future holds while not too confident about what our current generation is going to do with things. So as for how you can find me, uh, Connor Boyack, I'm easily Googleable. Uh, you know, look me up online. You can find my website, TuttleTwins.com is uh, where you can find those books. You can find Passion Driven Education on Amazon. Uh, but again, I'm easily Googleable. So if any of your listeners want to know more, uh, they can easily find me. Okay. And Connor Boyack. Boyack is spelled like boy, B O Y A C K. And yep. again, his, uh, inform- his website is thetuttletwins.com. And we'll be sure to link all that information that we discussed today on our website as well. But thank you so much, Connor. I, like I said, this is like I'm starstruck because <laughs> I just really appreciate you coming on and helping us light our minds on fire. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Connor Boyack and to get his books, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and get our new monthly newsletter. Then check out the services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of inspiring content, go to the sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net. For more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and now Instagram. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us. Leave us a review. Share our content. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 